Well, joining me now to look at the week in federal politics, as well as the country's response to the pandemic, are Mia Rabson. She is a parliamentary reporter for the Canadian Press, and Negan Sinclair. He is a writer and a columnist for the Winnipeg Free Press. Both of you, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Okay, well, let's start with, uh, I want to start first just to get your overall reactions to, we had the long-awaited testimony today from the Prime Minister's Chief of Staff, Katie Telford. She says she was told by the Privy Council, the senior bureaucrats in the government, that politicians had no business investigating allegations against the then Chief of Defence Staff, Jonathan Vance, that it was a Privy Council who should look into it. She said that's why she never asked more about it. She didn't inquire into the exact nature of the allegations. She said that was also why she didn't tell the Prime Minister about it. Um, I want to get your reaction to where things stand now after after this testimony. Start with you, Mia. Well, I think that from this government and from maybe the previous government, we have had now repeated maybe willful blindness to what was happening. Um, but I don't know that Katie Telford shed, shed any new light on the problem. We know there is a problem in the Canadian military. We know it needs to be fixed. Uh, what she had to say doesn't actually ex expand on that. It doesn't clear the water, it doesn't actually fix anything. And at this point, Parliament is, I, I think, needs to set aside the, po the politics of this and actually find a way to fix it. Because politics are not going to make the people of the military safer, and particularly women who come forward when they have allegations, and many serious allegations of, of harassment, of assault, uh, that need to get taken care of. Uh, sort of. The politics have to be put aside at this point. Okay, Nigan, your, uh, your reaction to today's latest episode in this, this, this look into it? Well, it's pretty shameful that most of this issue has been surrounding uh, which politician can cover whose but when and so on. When really the issue is that there is an unsafe environment in the military for women. Uh, it's perpetuated and often covered up by those in the military for other people who are their friends or their compatriots or colleagues or whatever uh, leads to people covering up the issue. And then uh, this is a systemic issue. I mean, this is going on decades. Reports have come out. Uh, there has been a number of initiatives that have been trying to deal with this issue. And the fact remains that Parliament has taken a blind eye to this uh, in various different governments. And the challenge here is how do we create a safe environment for women and also people from the LGBTQ community? How do we create that environment in which people can come forward in a safe manner and they will know that they will be heard. And the idea that the chief of staff would not be speaking with the prime minister is probably the most preposterous thing I've ever heard in my life because uh, obviously this is a major national issue with major implications. It would definitely come up in any conversation with the prime minister and to think otherwise is just absolutely absurd. Okay, I want to get to um, COVID because obviously that is so much of our issues that we deal with week in, week out. I want to talk about one thing that really, really, it was a dominant issue, debate, phenomena this week, and that was a, the phenomena of mixed messaging over vaccines. The National Advisory Committee on Immunization suggesting that the two uh, MRN, mRNA vaccines, Pfizer and Moderna, were preferred vaccines. In a way, they weren't saying anything new scientifically, that there were some advantages over the Johnson & Johnson and the AstraZeneca vaccine, but also suggesting that people might want to wait for the preferred vaccine. Government and public health authorities around the country spent the rest of the week trying to undo that message. Mia, you follow this very, very in-depth. In what do you make of what happened this week? Well, I have joked a few times, partly just because if I don't joke about things right now, uh, you know, things get a little bit too serious. But the communications around this issue are far more dangerous to my health right now than any kind of vaccine. So it is it was a complete mess. Uh, there is no doubt the communications that came out of that. The messaging is maybe understandable, but nobody really heard anything beyond preferred. It was the word choice. It was, well, and all of those people that were at that point, almost 2 million Canadians who've lined up and got the AstraZeneca shot. And all they heard was, wait, you're telling me I got second best. It took a few days. They came back. They tried to clarify. But ultimately, this is a communications problem. It's a really delicate thing to talk about. This vaccine and, well, these two vaccines, the AstraZeneca vaccine and Johnson & Johnson, we now know have this risk. It's remote. Uh, but it is still a serious risk, and three Canadians have now died from it. So it's not something you can ignore. And it is a really delicate thing to communicate to Canadians why they should keep taking this vaccine if it causes this. And this is the problem. If communicating science is really not that easy. And this was a message that just did not get delivered well. And it's, I mean, they've spent the week trying to fix it. They're still going to be fixing it. I mean, I wrote today 
There is a poll out. Less than half of Canadians have confidence in those two vaccines now. But that said, it's also a little bit of a moot point because going forward, choosing which vaccine you're going to get is going to be a choice at all between Pfizer and Moderna. More than 80% of the vaccines we're getting this spring and more than three quarters of the total vaccines we're getting by September are Pfizer and Moderna. So for the most part, Canadians aren't going to have to make this choice going forward. It doesn't make any of the millions of people who already got this vaccine feel Mm -hmm. any better. Okay, Nigan, I want to get your impression of this or or the whole vaccination issue. Uh, What do you make of it? Yeah, the fact is that the we're going to be absolutely flush with vaccine in probably two months, uh, even less so if the uh, supply chain doesn't break down. I mean, the fact is is exactly what Mia is saying, which is that every Canadian will have access to the, the vaccines with the highest efficacy rates, which are Moderna and Pfizer. Um, there's nothing, absolutely nothing wrong with the AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson. However, with Johnson & Johnson, there has been some data challenges uh, that I've written about in my column. And uh, the, the, we, people shouldn't be shopping around. You know, the bottom line of it is, is that, you know, if you are a person in a fairly privileged lifestyle, you're not in a high risk community, you're not in a situation in which you're in an overcrowded house or a First Nations community where COVID is more likely to pass than anything else. The AstraZeneca is perfect for you. Uh, the fact is that we need to focus on targeted areas, and that's why the vaccines with the higher efficacy rates must be targeted in those. And who are those? Those tend to be seniors. They tend to be uh, Indigenous peoples. They tend to be people in poverty communities. I mean, the fact is the rollout is working as planned, and people should uh, trust the process. And in the case of those who are feeling about which vaccine they should choose, uh, nobody the vaccine doesn't choose anything but you. And, and, or the the sickness doesn't do anything but pick you, and so uh, choosing the vaccine is an absolutely silly process because. Uh, the, if you're going to stop the sickness, uh, choose a vaccine that will assist you. Okay. And certainly the Johnson & Johnson and the AstraZeneca will protect you. Okay, I want to ask you, well, we've got you on. I mean, today we have some developing news out of Manitoba. The Premier is announcing a paid sick leave program, but he's also announcing a doubling of fines. And we're seeing figures that are now starting to skyrocket again in Manitoba. 500 cases after only about 300 cases. It's one of the single largest single-day increases. Is Manitoba joining the ranks of Ontario and Alberta in having underestimated and maybe neglected this third wave well this is a case today of don't be like doug ford and so uh, manitoba is trying to be proactive before the sick leave issue catches up to them in the ways in which it happened in ontario and so that announcement today was uh, albeit somewhat of a surprise probably was a proactive measure to uh, reduce criticism uh the prime minister the prime minister excuse me the premier here in manitoba brian pallister has been under fire for weeks now of staying too open too long and not acting approximately two weeks previous when even the provincial health lead on this uh dr rusin uh, indicated that we must shut down immediately that was two weeks ago and now exactly what happened today 500 cases that could have been stopped if restrictions had begun two weeks ago you know here here it is i have a daughter i have a daughter in grade nine uh, she's more very likely going to be going to strictly online learning uh, like those in ontario like those in alberta uh, the fact is that we are prepared for that and anyone who's knowing is in the know about this sickness knows that this is what needs to take place in order to be proactive to be able to reduce the count and here in manitoba we can't put our heads in the sand because uh the fact is we were at one point leading one of the places the hot spots in the world on covid 19 and we could easily get there again okay i want to give just a last word to mia in terms of what stands out for you in terms of this week and in terms of the third wave Um, I think that the two things this week are really just this communication about the vaccine and really hoping that it does not convince people not to get vaccinated, that it doesn't harm overall hesitancy uh, and make people more hesitant and know that they can still get these vaccines. They're safe. They will protect you from COVID. But also we are starting to see signs in Ontario of things getting a little bit better, which is hope. And we know that there is vaccines coming, which is hope. You sort of this this cling to notion that maybe we're almost there. Um, we really, we really, if we can just sort of hold on for another month, another two months, get all of these, all people uh, the first dose that they can, I, I do finally actually see hope for the summer. Okay, well, that's a good note to end on. I want to thank both of you. Thanks for taking the time. Yeah, me thank, thank you. you.